yesterday's video. I don't usually do two videos in two days straight. Uh, and in fact, if you go over my posting history, uh, I can be up to four or six months without uh, publishing a new video. But uh, I was home and um, yesterday I proposed to show a few, a few of the Portuguese and Brazilian editions of Marvel and DC books. And while I focused mostly on the special editions that came out in a US format, which to us was called the Lux format, uh, because the normal size was the Furmetinho, smaller size, uh, similar to Digest. And I was going to show some of those, and, and then I noticed that we were live for an hour, and I thought, okay, maybe maybe it's a good time to stop now and continue today, where I can show. So some of these comics are regular editions, but what I want to show specifically are the special editions, where big storylines were published, or there was a, an issue devoted specifically to a character, and those were big, really big, uh, thick, with something going between 130 and 260 pages uh, as a normal size. And th those were pretty expensive at the time, but compared to the uh, size of... Uh, to, compared to the price of an American comic, actually, a 200-page comic would be the same as a 48-page uh, edition would cost in the U.S. at the time. Okay, first visitor, Comic Crack is in the house. How are you doing, Terrence? So, since I... And the Gray Man is also here. The the, the Gray Man has been has been doing his daily blogs, and now he's taken to, to showcase uh, uh, links to, to a few uh, of the YouTubers he follows. So we'll go to his channel and be sure to check out each and every video he's been posting in the in the last few days because you'll be able to follow links to to other YouTubers you may not know. So anyway, I think let's let's get started. Since I want to showcase mostly uh, special editions, we're starting with this one from 1988, I believe. Yes, the Avengers, starring the Vision and the Scarlet Witch. Uh, th this is a, a this is a special edition which collects the original U.S. edition, of, uh, the original Vision and Scarlet Witch miniseries from 1982 in one sitting. Um, normally, they didn't have an Avengers title at the time; they were published in a, an anthology called Heroes da TV. They're frozen. Well, I. I can't tell from you. Let me see. Uh, from my end, it seems to be okay. Right. The wheel is spinning. Okay. From no, from from here, it seems to be working well. I don't. I don't, uh, I am checking the stream on my end. Uh. Let me know if you if you continue to have troubles. I may I may have okay. It's fine now. Okay, let's start over. <laughs> uh, the Avengers were published in an anthology called Heroes da TV, uh, so they didn't have their own title. Uh, after Heroes da TV was morphed into the X Men, the Avengers were transferred to Captain America, uh, where the fact that Cap Cap was a team member meant that they could either have a Captain America solo issue, and next month they would go. With uh, only with the Avengers and the other month they would have both, depending on what type of stories they wanted to, to tell at the time. And this being being something new at, uh, as as the publisher moved on to 19, 1980s comics to uh, from the, the early to the mid 1980s, the the direct market uh, allowed uh, Marvel to publish different types of comics, and the uh, Vision and Scarlet Witch was one. So. Faced with with that new type of material, Abril started to doing more special editions instead of treating the their anthologies like regular anthologies with where they could experiment. So they tried this one. Uh, I like I love this one especially because it has uh, Rick Leonardi art, 
and and this is where a lot of secrets regarding the vision and the scarlet witch were found specifically in issue number four where a certain arch villain was revealed to be the real father of Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch. Of course, the, the joke had been shown several times before, uh, but some, some writers can't live well enough alone. And they said, okay, if we hinted it, we have to confirm it. And Bill Montlow ended up doing exactly that when he did this miniseries. But of course, it was a, a very interesting read and it opened up uh, story possibilities for years and years. One thing that I like at the time, the they had changed from the comics, uh, the regular monthly comics were 80 pages and they used to have a spine. And at this time in 1988, they no longer did. But this one still did because it, this one uh, is 100 pages which was the the format that they chose to 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 give it a spine those actually these actually hold up better yes all right so let's move on to something else uh where's that yes now the the brazilian publisher editora abril and a at two uh, quarterly titles for uh, for special storylines during the most of the 80s and 90s. And where are they? I need one. Yes, I do. This is not it. This is not it. Oh, this is different. Yeah, I'm going to show this one. Here we go. Hey, and there's Night Tiger. How you doing, Night Tiger? <laughs> Need more comics. Where are the comics? I guess this is it. Okay, the two titles that I was talking about, this is terrible, <laughs> that error. The two titles that I was talking about were Grand Heroes Marvel. It doesn't have a logo, it's just featured here. Uh, on, at, the, at the time, it didn't have a logo. It started having a logo from issue number 20. Uh, the logo was, was here. I'll show the, uh, another issue later. And they just had a, the big logo with the character. This issue is number uh, 14, 13, 11. And of course, it features uh, the, le the legend battle. First battle with Dr. Doom in Camelot's time. Let's see some art. Art, art, art. What can I show? Here. No Iron Man and Doctor Doom, but pretty good. And some more. Okay, yes. Doom and Iron Man having to work together to build the time machine that is going to take them out of the Middle Ages. And both of them having to trust each other. Doctor Doom, of course, distrusts everyone, and he probably thinks that Iron Man is just a, a flunky, a lackey, uh, unintelligent. And of course, at the time, Iron Man uh, had no public identity. Nobody knew who the man uh, under the inside the armor was. Uh, Tony Stark kept the appearance that Iron Man was his personal bodyguard, although the two were never seen together, some bodyguard. So. What he is afraid is that uh, Dr. Doom is going to end up stealing his technology. So this was the Marvel title. The, 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 in this title, 
they killed off Adam Warlock in number one, Phoenix in number seven, and uh, Guardian in number 15. The DC title was called Superpowers, which I believe was a timeline in the United States. Uh, interesting, this one uh, with the with the Batman. This is one of the very few painted Bill Sienkiewicz covers that were very common at, uh, um, at in Marvel at the time in, during the 1980s. And they published very few of these. And maybe the 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 best one they, that they actually used was this one from DC. This story is from Batman number 400. Here's the Joker. And the Batman inside. It was one chapter by Steve Lattle, now this one is by Art Adams now. Catman appears here. <laughs> so different art style. The Mastodon is here. How you doing? And we have six people watching. That's great. The superpowers issues never attracted me as much as um, as the Grand Zero of Marvel. So, but that's where they ran the final chapter of the Judas Contract. Uh, that's where they ran uh, the superhero storyline with side uh, the Great Darkness Saga. Uh, parts of Millennium were there, but in the uh, very interesting uh, that stroke story featuring the Batman was also run in this title. This issue is something that was not normal at the time. Was It includes uh, a cover gallery. Since most of these comics have 80 pages, they usually only use... They have three or four stories and only one cover. Another special edition. Conan and Red Sonia Almanac. This is one of the older issues. It still has the the old type in dish. It's from 1984. And at, at the time, the, they were trying to figure out exactly what to do with Conan. Uh, they uh, they finally had the, the rights to publish Savage Sword stories at the time, but they were running them inside the color magazines. And so they until they finally launched the Savage Sword title, which uh, ran not only uh, the black and white stories, but also some of the color stories uh, straight from the black and white art. But, but they knew that they that Conan was their best bet at doing a, a more adult publish uh, adult publishing venture, and they, they ended up doing Savage Sword was their f first oversized magazine that was uh, uh, published on a permanent basis. One thing that these comics had in the early 80s, they had ads in the margins. And sometimes they, they were about storylines in, uh, in other comics, and but sometimes they, they ended up like this and it looks terrible, especially because it's advertising uh, toddy uh, fl uh, flavored powdered milk uh, to uh, flavored powder to add to your milk, which is a, a children's drink, and of course, this being Conan, it's not exactly the the most appropriate children's material. Especially here, it's typical Conan and the ladies. Oh, I, uh, Night Tiger, I read most of these. Uh, they had some very interesting, uh, some very complete editorial pages. Uh, no, not Nesquik, Toddy. It's a different one. They had some in uh, the, the editorial pages uh, with the with the letter columns. They also had explanations on, on what they were doing. Be uh, they, 
because a lot of people asked uh, what were the, the the way that they chose stories and uh, why did they cut off pages um why did they miss an issue here and there uh, because they, they sometimes not publish fill-in issues they were not necessary to the story and so they they have a lot of info uh, on the way that they did things the editor abril was the the first brazilian publisher to treat their um, their readers uh, as intelligent beings instead of thinking that they were all children but uh, of course the commercial department uh, 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 had other ideas and that's how we end up with uh, adverts where they're not supposed to be this type of this type of issues are usually ended up evolving into other areas Oh, another issue of Grandes Heróis Marvel. This one features the Fantastic Four. They managed to squeeze six, six, no, seven, no, six comics in an 80 page format. They cut and pasted several bits of story here um, on most of the most of these. Uh, the originals at 17 pages, of course, and you multiply by four, you get uh, 76, which is good to fill up an 80 an 80 page comic. Uh, and you then you remove all the the recap pages, but you still have to go and cut and snip to make sure that everybody that everything fits. Uh, I, I don't think I, I remember seeing the this storyline entirely, but th this is the storyline where uh, Galactus defeats the the Sphinx, which is where Marvel Wolfman picked up some plot plot threads from uh, the Nova title. Night Tiger, uh, I'm not sure if you're still if you're still active on Facebook. There's a Facebook group called Foreign Comics Collecting. Uh, there are people from all over the world. Uh, they everybody helps each other find comics from uh, different countries. So you 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 ask around there. There's a four or five Brazilians there. They they'll be able to help you. Some of them are quite knowledgeable about old issues of uh, GB. Which is the the most famous of the 1940s mag uh, comic magazines? The, the, there's several posts with uh, pictures from the GB comic, so you, you'll be able to find those. Now, the, these titles, Grand Zero Age Marvel and Superpowers, they evolved, and uh, in this case, issue number 35, by this time, uh, it had this logo, and it, it was kind of elastic. So this is this is a the the way that the Brazilians read uh, Weapon X storyline. Special one hundred and thirty page issue. This comic was usually eighty, sometimes hundred. There's Luis Michael. How you doing? And Samuel Trejo. This is getting busy. This is, uh, so getting back. This is how the Brazilians read. Instead of waiting uh, every two weeks for a new eight page installment. Uh, they just had this special edition. Uh, all the 130-page storyline is here, along along with editorial pages exp explaining the the creative process. Interview with Barry Windsor Smith at the end of the of the comic, but the rest of this is all Barry Windsor Smith goodness. Finally, showcasing Wolverine's origin. This is a very raw, uh, raw story. Uh, this was, I remember being very impressed at the time uh, with all the the story beats. It's just Wolverine, uh, hardly speaking, uh, being treated like an animal, and then we just have the. The three scientists studying him, treating like subject. We nobody. There's very. Li it's it's a very personal story for Wolverine. Like we're going through everything he's going. He's through everything he's suffering, and but there's some disconnection from from the pain. Uh, we're trying to feel what type of pain he's feeling here. But of course, we can't. Nobody has ever done anything like this to to a person, to another person. 
So that's how this style evolved. We have, and we have a few others. Now, uh, some of you may be familiar with the old uh, or Origins of Marvel Comics and Son of Origins of Marvel Comics uh, trade paperbacks from the 1970s. Uh, these are similar. Origins of the Marvel Superheroes. This has a, a modern cover, but this issue in particular features several interesting moments from the history of Marvel Comics. And, all right, where is it? Okay, here it is. This very famous moment when the the Submariner returns to, to comics in 1962. Fantastic Four number four. Another one is number 12, which is the confirmation that the Marvel superheroes exist in all, all in the same universe. This is the first meeting between the Hulk and the Fantastic Four. Matarog is in the house. How you doing, Roger? Next, Amazing Spider-Man number three. So this was this was this was the type of, the type of comic that really interested me at the time. Uh, I, I always want uh, wanted to know. Um, where the the superheroes came from, or what was their origin, and of course there were no no stories available, no no stories available with no magazines where I could read the old stories. So every time something something proposing to show the the origin stories of a lot of the old characters, I was on it. And of course, my for the the first time I read this. Captain America joins the Avengers in Avengers number four. Of course, this being Editor Abril, there are several changes in the translation that uh, that that make it seem that the, the in order to 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 fit with established continuity. They change dialogue so that, uh, unlike in the original Avengers number four, uh, Namor and Captain America recognize each other from World War II, which is uh, something that uh, was later retconned as the Marvel Universe progressed. It's not in Avengers number four, but it's here in the translation. This number two is also pretty good. Uh, Todd McFarlane cover. This was expensive at the time. It's good. It's good. And it yeah, 150, almost 150 pages. What does this one have? Amazing Spider-Man Annual Number One, featuring the Sinister Six. No, that's not it. This is Amazing Spider-Man Number One. Amazing Spider-Man Annual One is in another. I think I have another issue with that one. This is Amazing Spider-Man Number One. where Captain America saves John Jameson's space pod, and that's where Jane Jonah Jameson starts his campaign against him. Also number 20, introducing the Scorpion. Steve Ditko's art kind of suffers a downgrade with the with the art reduced to fit into this size it does not look as as grandiose uh, as it does in the u.s comic because of course that quest is idiosyncratic style which does not seem at first glance very appropriate for action scenes and if you reduce the art it doesn't pop out as much you'd miss out on the ditko -ness. Another one, X Men number nine, the com the first confrontation between the X Men and the Avengers, and of course, 
the origin of Professor X. Still Jack Kirby on the X-Men. Jack Kirby was the the first title that that the X uh, and the X-Men were the were the first title where uh, started by Kirby, uh, where where he left very early and he gave the the title to Warner Roth, who was terrible at superheroes. Ah, and Bedlam at Baxter Building from Fantastic Four Annual Number One. And the wedding scene with Reed Richards and Susan Storm. Oh, yeah, yeah they did that. Um, they did that in Secret Wars. They did that in an issue of Hulk. They did that in an issue of Spider-Man. Then in another issue of Hulk. <laughs> yeah, um... There was a problem in the in the 1980s. The thing that Louis Michael is talking about here, in the chat, in the 1980s, um, some heroes were further along in continuity than others. Captain America and Hulk were f further along in continuity, and we, when the Avengers guest starred, they had to erase uh, Monica Rambeau and, and Star Fox because they hadn't joined the Avengers yet. Nobody even knew who Monica Rambeau was, so they did some very creative. Um, white out jobs and drew something something completely different over the the character. In one case, it was a machine. In another, they they did the Scarlet Witch. They turned Star Fox into the Beast. Uh, the Spider Man already had his black costume. They painted over the with the original colors. And something different here now mo most most of the the stories that they ran in these titles were from the 60s and the the only one that's more modern is this one savage she Hulk number one she Hulk, of course in her own title not very interesting but but when she joined the the Avengers, uh, she finally became the character she was meant to be, uh, very, uh, one of the most interesting in the Marvel Universe, and I really don't like what they've done with the character in the last few years. Okay, and finally the last story in this issue. This, The Sinister Six from Amazing Spider-Man Annual Number One. <laughs> How uh, they pull that off? The 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 publisher Abril, uh, they're a big publisher. They have uh, other types of magazines besides comics, so they have a very large editorial office, and they add art. They have artists on staff. Usually, they're in charge of doing the the ads and stuff and the paste ups. Uh, in this case, they paint. Okay, now you draw over Spider Man and paint over uh, so that he, he looks normal instead of. Instead of stuff that's only going to happen in two years. Now, if there's something interesting, the the Brazilians even did a few things like uh, pretending to run their own storylines, and they they created their their own events based on what they were publishing. Well, a famous one during the, the the mid to late '80s was the Dire Wraith War. Of course, that didn't that did not exist, but uh, they took advantage of when the Dire Wraith starting appearing in other titles besides Rom the Space Knight. Um, they devised their own logo and started putting it in every comic in Captain America in the X Men, and the, so that the the story was. Uh, progressing tightly be weaving between all the titles until it culminated into one of the comics that I'm going to show uh, right after. But first, I want to show the other title, the other big saga that did not exist, which was the Thanos saga. These are reprints of stories that were originally published in um, 
Iroj de TV in around 1982-1983. And they, they finally did a five-issue miniseries uh, reprinting all of these. And the, the first two feature Captain Marvel, the Captain Marvel part of the event with Thanos. Um, these are only the, the Jim Starlin issues, uh, except for one issue where the, they run a Daredevil, a Daredevil story, which is done by Steve Gerber. But everything else is has Starlin involved, either as writer or as writer, artist, or both. And issues three, four, and five feature Adam Warlock. The problem. They only started. They, they only started dealing with the Starlin issues in, on, on um, halfway through number four because, uh, first in issues number three and most of number four, they did all, not only did they show the origin story, but they also ran the entire Counter Earth saga. And so it took a long while until they got to what we actually wanted to read, which was the Jim Starlin issues uh, featuring the Universal Church of Truth and the and the, the Mega storyline and the final the final battle with Thanos in the two annuals. So speaking of the dire rates, it all culminated here in this very thick book, Super Almanac Marvel, with 260 pages. They never published a, a, a Marvel comic so thick. A, yes, Louis Michael, the um, the master, the, the He-Man stories were made in-house by Editor Abril. Uh, unlike the Thundercats stories, uh, they both ran with the Star Comics title. Uh, the Thundercats were from the US. The, the He-Man stories were done inside. I thought that the Brave Star stories were also done by by Brazilians, but they weren't. They they were they were made in Italy. So, so of course this one on the, for the for the first one they decided to have uh, several different characters in the in the same book. We have Spider-Man in here. Featuring the, the Hobgoblin in the black uniform before Venom. Then there's John Burns Fantastic Four. This is that issue where we have cameos from several comic strip characters and then of course we have the end of the rom storyline With, with all the superheroes uh, basically making a cameo because they, they really don't help out much. But at the time, this was a big deal. And yeah, it's what fills up more pages in, inside this, this comic. This was very expensive at the time. And finally, X Men. This is the the first time that they meet uh, Thunderbird's brother Warpath. Uh, this with the new costume designed by John Romita Jr. for Colossus. Also, I think that's redesigning Rogue's uniform. And that's it. So 260 pages of goodness. 
for the first time and this uh, this title uh, did not it, it wasn't published regularly it, we, you didn't know when the next one was going to uh, was going to be uh, so but usually it was annual at first then we had two issues per year uh, published monthly uh, one after the other and that was so that we could have things like this the evolutionary wars one thing that that I want to showcase with this one was that uh, they it, it has a cover from Marvel Age instead of from one of the annuals it was not the first time that it happened uh, so essentially imagine that you have uh, a two issue mini series each issue is 200 pages this is what we had here this was amazing. Look up, both of them look very thick. Yeah, slightly heavier than newspaper and and also better uh, better printing. The the colors used in the editorial issues were much better than what Marvel was using in the eighties. For uh, for part two of this one, they decided on using the Gwen Stacy clone. Uh, they, uh, the way they, they chose covers was very opportunistic. It was more. Uh, um, yes, uh, yesterday um, Matt Roybal from the foreign comic from the foreign comics Facebook group um, did the second part of a video on the um, on foreign foreign versions of. Amazing Spider-Man number 300. And he was complaining that the Brazilians used a composite cover made up of inside art instead of the typically the typical famous famous cover by Todd McFarlane. But what what these guys usually did was they they had an understanding of what type of cover would be more appealing and make the making this the, the issue where the amazing spider-man number 300 appeared uh, making it more uh, mysterious was more appealing to just have a, an action shot by Todd McFarlane. After the Evolutionary War, uh, the next year they came back with what was essentially another two issue mini series. Uh, those were six numbers six and seven. Number eight and nine features Atlantis attacks, and uh, once more one of them has a cover from Marvel Age. Because it's one where, where uh, several unre several unrelated characters appear. The Punisher, the Wolverine, and Namor. Of course, this this one was also very famous. I didn't. I never took out the stickers with with the prices. The when they went on newsstands because they came from Brazil, the they got the price either on a sticker or written in pencil, and I never bothered taking out the stickers. One thing that I wanted to show from these ones was the um, the ads on the the ads at the back so this one as an ad for for a, a French adult comic that they were publishing at the time in the graphic novel line Lulu Smack by Frank Margerin this just has a very cryptic quasar logo it would debut uh, the, the next month in an issue of Grand Zero Age Marvel This this one uh, features uh, Conan Saga, which was, at the time was a new, uh, was a new title, fe featuring Conan reprints. And this, in spite of being a Marvel comic, it has it's advertising a DC storyline, Armageddon two thousand one. This is of course pretty normal. You found uh, the, the 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 superhero line was managed from one office. And they wanted to make sure that you would buy all of their comics. It does. It didn't matter if it was Marvel or DC. And another one that I want to show from Super Aventura, Super Almanac Marvel number four, flip cover, Thor, Iron Man. Thor, Iron Man, pretty cool. Everybody loved it at the time. Two hundred forty pages on this one. Uh, 
another special edition. This one from DC, Emerald Twilight, all in one comic. This was already published after the the Portuguese associate of the of the Brazilian Abril uh, started publishing some stuff here. So these were the Brazilian comics repackaged with the new lettering and making sure that they follow the European Portuguese grammar instead of the Brazilian Portuguese. And the title, Epicus Marvel. Uh, this is issue number six, features the Return of the Defender storyline uh, with not very good art. Uh, I, didn't, I, knew, I didn't buy this at the time, I only bought, bought it years later. Yeah, that, yeah, great man, that's the translation. <laughs> Uh, we got the complete King. Uh, I remember King Conan for sale, but I, I never bought it. Uh, I should have because they had some interesting John Buscema art. And finally, another one that I wanted to show. This is what a, a title called Giant Size X Men looks like in Brazil and Portugal. These, of course, are the Portuguese variants. Both of them are 260 pages. Number one features the Executioner's Song storyline. Pretty good visual effects on this one. In the Kubert cover. Well, this one is Fatal Attractions, where Magneto pulls out Wolverine's adamantium. Of course, it also has the entire storyline in, in 60 pages. And uh, that was it from the stuff that I wanted to show. Uh, I got a few others here just to, to show off, but they're not as important. Because when we had these special editions, you knew you had to get them. Something important was going down. Uh, and while we, we knew we, we always had good stories in the, in the main titles like, like this ones, we knew that those ones were really, really important and that we had to read them. Anyway, let's show off a few of them. So now, now we're just gonna. I just, now I'm not going to spend much time talking about them. I'm just going to show them off. And so, X Men to twenty ninety nine. Uh, a very neat trick that they pulled off on this one because this is Skullfire from the, the X Men twenty ninety nine. But because you can see the, the skeleton, they use it to advertise beginning here, Ghost Rider 2099. Ghost Rider, of course, having a, a very different art style that was not a, as interesting on the cover. Another X-Men 2099. This begins the, the President Doom storyline by Warren Ellis. The Incredible Hulk versus Wolverine, very famous cover. People who collect uh, foreign editions take note. Hulk three. Let's show off some from Hulk three hundred and forty. Some action. Also, some new mutant stories inside. Newton Titans, part of the Judas Contract storyline. Why did Terra betray the Titans? New Titans num number 33. This is when the 
the Flash solo title begins with uh, Wally West take, uh, having taken over the mantle. Uh, this is, of course, written by Mac Barron. Captain America number 161. This is uh, the, the culmination of the John Walker Captain America storyline. Here it's on a very a very strange numbering, 161, instead of being on a, on 350 like the original. But wh while they advertise this on a cover, this is only the final uh, story in the title. This begins with part of the Inferno storyline. which means the debut of none other than a Gilgamesh. <laughs> Titans number 17, Wally quits being Kid Flash, Dick quits being Robin. And it also sets up the, the Brother of Blood storyline. Captain America number 153 with the homage cover to number four with the new costume. United TV number 92. This was part of the, the setup to the Yesterday Quest storyline. And besides the Avengers, it also features Thor. With art by Walt Simonson, but completely drowned by Tony Dizuniga inks. No, no, not the original US floppies. There's a couple of them that I have in trade paperback. I'd, re I'd rather have the trade paperbacks, uh, because then I can collect the, the stories in an easy-to-get volume. Oh, and Micronauts as well. I think this was the last time that they published a Micronaut story. Super Aventures Marvel, number 62. The, the beginning of the... The beginning of the Fall from Grey storyline. By Frank Miller and David Mazzucchelli. First appearance of Binary. Cover art by Dave Cockrum. Here's an issue of Wolverine back when John Byrne was uh, drawing with Archie Goodwin writing. Uh, they kind of undid, they hadn't done uh, the, hello, what's going on here? Okay, it's back. They, they undid the, the Claremont style stories that they were running with where Wolverine was not being a superhero and here he's always in, uh, and th in this one with John Byrne is always in costume. And Spider-Man 2099 with the debut of Doctor Strange 2099. So these were just for fun. Uh, and I'm done. Uh, so if somebody if somebody wants to join, I can I can share the the link in the chat. But if the if nobody wants to join, um, I think I'll, I'll shut down the stream instead. So let me know if anyone wants to get in. <laughs> oh, I'm always going to be a wannabe. There's a lot of people that uh, I love to 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 pick their brains. Yeah, every everybody's in, invited. If no, if nobody comes on, I'm just going to sh to shut down the stream. But if anybody wants to talk for a while, I can be here for a little for a little longer. Everybody's the noob for the next twenty years because everybody who's been here twenty years be before you. 
uh, we'll always keep knowing, knowing more, but it's always good. He, he, as long as you keep being interested in the stuff and retain all your enthusiasm and be curious, you'll always uh, know, uh, know what you want to, to find out. So one of the guys that I love more in uh, in comics is Robert Beerbohm, the the guy who used to own the comics and comics store in uh, San Francisco in the 1970s. He was friends with Jack Kirby. He helped organize uh, conventions. He's one of the guys, uh, and I love every time he posts something in the in the comic book historians uh, Facebook group. Uh, I'm always interested in in reading. He, the the comic book historians have a pod, a three hour podcast talking to him. Okay. Well, if nobody wants to come in, the, in that case, I'll shut down the stream. In any case, uh, thank you very much to to everybody for uh, for stopping by. Uh, Simple Simon, Louis Michael, the Mastodon, Grayman, uh, Clark and Jeans, Night Tiger, Metarog. Who else? We had a lot of people here today. Amazing. Uh, Samuel David was here. Samuel Trejo was here. Comic Crack also in the beginning. And I think I. I didn't forget anyone, but thank you all for for uh, coming the, earlier at 9 p.m. I don't know. I, I I did this at this time so I could catch the the people in North America. But uh, when when I try to when I try to do this stuff, will probably always be around uh, midnight at UK time. Okay. In that case, any in any case, uh, thank you all all for coming. Uh, I'll try to do these on a more regular basis, and uh, I'll see if I can invite some someone on. Uh, I want to have somebody to talk to sometimes. Um, yeah. So until next time, uh, keep reading old comics.